Well, hey there, Prakapton. Welcome back to Practical Stoicism. I'm your host, as always, Tanner Campbell, and today I will be joined by Dr. William Stevens. Sorry, that's Professor William Stevens, because I think it's actually the case that professor is a higher distinction than doctor. That's something I feel like I learned recently. And I don't think Professor Stevens is particularly hoity-toity about being given his title dues, but just in case he is, I want to make sure that I refer to him by the title he's earned. You already know William Stevens, so I won't spend any time introducing him or telling you about anything he's got going on. You know about his new book. I'll link it in the show notes. You can check it out if you haven't already. But in today's conversation, we're going to talk about oikiosis because oikiosis is the theme of this month. And in particular, we're going to get some clarification on what oikiosis is and whether or not the things I said on Monday are, you know, really lining up with what the ancient Stoics thought of oikiosis. And then on Monday, you're going to get some practical advice from me about how to sort out exactly what it is you're supposed to care about. Not these vague allusions to doing the right thing or using your logic. I'm not going to say just that. I'm going to give you some steps to identify through a logical lens what things you're supposed to be concerned with as you, the individual you. So the advice is going to be of the sort that will be able to be applied uniquely for everyone. I don't believe I have any new patrons to thank since I recorded the last episode. If I've missed any, don't worry, I will get you your shout-outs on Monday. Thank you for your support. If you're not already a patron of this show, please consider becoming one. It's nice to feel appreciated, for one. It's nice to be financially supported by the people who appreciate this content. That's two. And, you know, there's a reality where this show doesn't happen if I'm not supported. And that's three. So hopefully one of those three reasons, or all of them, convinces you that $5 a month is worth it to get rid of ads, support a creator you value, and whose content you value, and get access to a bunch of other things that I have planned for patrons only this year, including, perhaps, some in-person local events. Did I just hint at a global tour? Well, maybe. Or maybe not. We'll have to see how things work out. As is tradition, we're going to break for a couple of ads, and then we're going to get into the first segment of my conversation with Professor William Stevens. Enjoy the ads, and I'll see you on the other side. I have used a lot of commerce platforms in the past. By far, the most robust is Shopify. No matter how complex your business needs and no matter how large your business grows, Shopify can handle it. And they do handle it for brands like Rothy's, Ruggable, Allbirds, Knox, Magnolia, Brooklinen, Glossier, and Cotton, to name a few. You may already use another e-commerce platform, and you may be super unhappy with it, but you've already put a lot of work into it, and migrating to Shopify could seem impossible. But I'm here to tell you that it is quite easy. When I migrated to Shopify back in 2022, their apps and tools meant I just had to make a few clicks and everything was ported over as if by magic. Shopify also lets you design your storefront however you like, which, from personal experience, I know isn't the case for many other commerce platforms out there. All these features and all this control can result in more sales more often, so stop leaving sales on the table, switch your business to Shopify today, and discover why millions trust Shopify as their all-in-one commerce platform to build, grow, and run their businesses. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial at shopify.com forward slash practical, all lowercase. That's one month for just $1 at shopify.com forward slash practical, shopify.com forward slash practical. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right. New music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. Okay, so we're going to talk about oikiosis, which is, well, I guess I'll start with that question. Is oikiosis strictly a Stoic concept, or does it come to us prior to that through another philosophy? Uh, I, I believe that it's an original coinage, that the it wasn't really used by previous philosophers. Uh, so I think 
it's really an original Stoic idea. Um, certainly, you know, the language oikion, meaning, you know, what, what belongs to oneself or what's familiar, what, what's akin, right? That root meaning um, in Greek means things like your family, right? Your closest family members, like if it's in your household. So when the Stoics expanded on that concept, they, they really devised this new notion of oikiosis as this process by which an individual recognizes what belongs to her or what is akin to her or what is familiar to her, um, what, is, what is appropriate for her or proper. Um, so this is the first challenge of the Greek term is that it's really difficult to translate into English because it has that range of meanings. But overall, it is the concept of coming to realize that which is yours to be concerned with. Is that a, is that a good definition? Yes. And one does not need to be a Stoic in contemporary times to find value in this idea, right? No, no, it's, no, it's, uh, it's a powerful concept. Um, and yeah, you don't have to subscribe to Stoic principles in order to see its value and understand its importance. It really speaks to how we fit into the rest of the world, how we relate to our friends, our family members, our members of the community, our neighbors, our fellow citizens, and then more broadly, humanity as a whole. And then beyond that, we also belong. We're parts of an even broader whole, which is the entire biosphere of the planet, all other living things on the planet. Um, so we're connected to ecosystems um, that we impact in our behavior, both individually and collectively uh, with other people. So it's really a very broad and all-encompassing concept that offers guidance on how we relate to everything that is related to us, everything that we're connected to, and it expands our vision of what our, our moral duties are. Would you say I was right or wrong? in the assessment that most people who think of stoicism don't think of anything you just said. <laughs> that is not what contemporary- Right, yeah, no, this is, yeah. I mean, it's so, you know, you 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 rub elbows with with these Substack, Reddit, who, who, what's the criticism, the Discord? Yeah, the Discord people, right? All the people. All, all, all the people. Yeah, I mean, so for my understanding is for contemporary practitioners of Stoicism, they think in terms of Stoicism as a life hack. How is Stoicism going to help me win friends, influence people, make more money, live a, 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 a more serene life, get rid of, you know, problems in, and manage my emotions and that sort of thing. So if you think of it as a life hack, then it, it you know, that for you, right? How, how is Stoicism going to make my life better? How's it better for me? I mean, th this sort of outlook suggests, you know, a very kind of egoistic orientation, right? It's all about me. How am I going to handle my emotions? How am I going to deal with people so I live a happier life? Uh, and so there's going to be a lot of emphasis on what people call the dichotomy of control, but which I prefer to call the fundamental divide, and how you apply that. And there's utility in that. That's, that's a piece of the stoic pie, for sure. But that's not the whole dessert. That's not the whole thing, right? So this is a more, what? I don't want to say arcane. We could say lesser known. This is a lesser known concept in Stoicism that informs their political philosophy. And usually people don't think of Stoicism as having a political philosophy, a social and political philosophy. But this is it. And it's really powerful because it describes our psychology and how we develop from infancy to adulthood. And this is not something that many people know about Stoicism. And so, you know, kudos to you, Tanner, for having an episode on this. This is well worth doing. So I am presently reading The History of Philosophy by Grayling. And one of the things that I don't think that I, I really should have known, right? I call myself a philosopher of Stoicism. I really should have known this, that going through the history of 
Western philosophy, Stoicism is really the last stop before skepticism, and then everything that came in what is, I guess, referred to as either medieval or modern times for philosophy. So Stoicism is, and correct me if I'm wrong here, William, but it's the most advanced, I would, I, maybe it's because I'm a Stoic, so I want to say that, but it seems like it's built on the shoulders of all the giants that came before, and maybe it shouldn't be so surprising, and I want to say more about character in a minute, but it shouldn't be so surprising that it has this depth to it that a lot of people are missing because it, it is the tot it feels like it's the totality of all Greek philosophy that came before it. It's like the best worked out theory. And then skepticism comes in and says, we can't know anything. Good night. <laughs> Combination. Yeah. Well, I mean, just to be just to be picky here, the Stoics in the Hellenistic period, the Stoics were contemporaries with the Epicureans and the skeptics. And in fact, uh the the Peronian skeptics, uh the skeptics deserve a lot of credit for helping make Stoicism as rigorous a system of philosophy as it is, because the skeptics had really powerful arguments. They called them tropes or modes, argument types that they used to attack any what they call dogmatic philosophy. And Stoicism is a dogmatic philosophy, which just means that they're not skeptics. Skeptics suspend judgment about the truth of any sort of opinion, doctrine, teaching, belief. And Stoics don't suspend their opinions on all doctrines and beliefs. They embrace Stoic doctrines and Stoic teachings, as the Epicureans do. So the Epicureans and Stoics and skeptics were all contemporaries in the Hellenistic period. Stoicism does, and, and I'm biased here, but my view is that, you know, I, I agree with you that Stoicism is has some more sophisticated arguments than Epicureanism does. But the Epicureans were no slouches either. So Thanks to skepticism challenging Stoicism, the Stoics were really pushed to develop a more sophisticated epistemology, a more sophisticated logic, which, which was a huge advance over Aristotle's uh, categorical reasoning with their sentential logic or propositional logic. And yes, after, after these Hellenistic philosophies, then you know, you've got, you still have Neoplatonism, or what's called Neoplatonism, the ideas of Plotinus and his followers leading into early medieval thought. Can I actually just point one thing out there? You said Neoplatonist, and I think it's possible that a lot of people may have heard that term and thought that it was Neoplatonic, that it would have something to do with Plato. Yeah, so scholars, at least, uh, it, it might be somewhat old hat to describe it this way, but for the, the tradition is to refer to the philosophy of Plotinus as a new Platonism, a, as Neoplatonic, taking some ideas from Plato and recasting them, revising them. But if, if you're a fan of Plotinus, you might bridle a bit at that characterization because he was an original thinker. So it, it, I, you know, so it, the custom is to refer to the thought of Plotinus, his philosophy, and his followers commentating on his philosophy as Neoplatonic, the Neoplatonic tradition. But it, it, more, it might be more accurate just to call it Plotinianism, and some scholars do that. <laughs> Plotini the genie? Can we refer to him that way? <laughs> the Plotini genie? Yeah. No? Plotinus. <laughs> Plato and Plotinus. Okay. Yes. Stoicism, obviously, well, obvious to you and I, provides a lot of, can we say doctrine, to helping people to do that. And it does feel as though oikiosis is the very foundation of that. So you you talked about early earlier, and we were chatting before we hit record, about the two fundamental arguments for oikiosis in Stoic theory. And that was from the womb, and then we develop further from the womb, and the argument starts to be more based in justice. Can you, can you take us through that, please? Yes. Yeah, so it, it's a two-stage argument. Uh, so, so the first one describes what happens when a baby is born. When you have a newborn baby in the crib, it has an impulse to identify what belongs to it and what's alien to it. So this is the antonym for oikiosis, is alienation. This is the opposite of oikiosis. What is, what is other? What is different? What doesn't belong to me? That's it. That's alienation. Oikiosis is the process of recognizing and, and being naturally drawn to 
what belongs to me, what's akin to me, what's proper to me, right? So for the infant, it seeks what's going to sustain its own body, its own physical constitution. And so it's going to be drawn to the mother, to the warmth of the mother, to, you know, the mother's milk, right? To sustain it. It, it, it you know, it's breastfeeding, right? This is oikiosis. And so since the infant loves itself, this is the initial impulse or manifestation, we could say, of oikiosis. The baby loves itself, and so it seeks to take to itself what is going to sustain it and promote it, its body, right? This is the self-love that drives its behavior. This is the psychological theory, right? So then as it develops, it its mental understanding becomes more sophisticated. And so as it ages and matures into adolescence, the Stoics theorized that at the age of 12, 12 or 13, its potential for rationality is actualized, is gradually actualized around the age of 13 or so. And when this happens, this is transformative. So this is then the second tier or the second stage of development of the individual human being. What happens is the adolescent, the young adult, does not primarily identify its body as itself anymore, but rather has a transformed self-understanding, self-perception that what is its true self is its mind, not its body, but its mind its rationality, its intelligence. And so love of self becomes love of rationality, love of that intelligence, that mentality, right? And when the young adult recognizes that its mind is its truest self, its most important self, then it recognizes that the needs of the body are actually subordinate to that. And that what promotes its sanity, its rationality, is of utmost importance but it also recognizes other minds, right? It overcomes what philosophers call the problem of solipsism. Solipsism is the view that the only mind that exists is mine. I'm the only intelligent being. Everything else is just a perception that I have, right? So this is the wackiest view in philosophy, solipsism. But rational beings recognize that there are other rational beings. So this recognition transforms the individual's understanding of what belongs to it and what it belongs to. So for the rational adult, it recognizes that other human beings belong to it, family members, friends, neighbors, but indeed all other rational beings constitute a community. And this is the origin, according to the Stoics, for the the concept of justice, right? That we are not atomic. We are not just billiard balls that click against each other. We're connected to each other organically as members of the same living body. Stoics use this language a lot, right? You see it in Marcus, you see it in Epictetus and Seneca, right? That we're all members of the same corporate body. Society has a number of different living parts and they're called human beings, right? So we relate to all other members in our community, in our social world, in our society, as fellow rational beings. And this connects with the Stoic concept of cosmopolitanism, right? The cosmopolis is this huge mega city, and all rational beings are citizens of that cosmic city. And so we have obligations to each other to promote the good of the whole. That's whole, W-H-O-L-E. That's what ransomware is all about. It's psychological pressure. Ransomware, when your computer's hacked into and your data held ransom. Attacks are on the rise and Russian gangs are making billions of dollars. The moment I got that message, I knew our greatest fears that we ever have are starting to come true. The post-Cold War era is over. Dot com, the hacking. A new season from Crowd Network with me, Katie Puckrick. Just search for dot com, that's D-O-T-C-O-M, and subscribe. Yes. 
My favorite thing is to raise my hand while speaking to William because he's a professor, so he has a tendency to not give you a spot to interrupt him. He's very good at it. But I want to interrupt you, and I want to provide you the opportunity to specify the difference between stoic justice and the word justice as is used by most people, including myself in everyday language and probably by you as well, that these are not the same thing. And how are they not the same thing? Well, um, some people, when they use the word justice, have in mind a legal system. So there's this concept of procedural justice. So, you know, for Americans or expatriate Americans like yourself, since you're now a, a Brit of some sort, are you a British citizen now? No. How would I do that so quickly? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. One, one day. And then I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, and then I'm going to run for kingship. I can do that, right? That's a thing I can do. <laughs> I think that's difficult. But uh, so this notion of procedural justice is just that in the law courts, right? If there's a civil or a criminal issue or case, then, you know, with the prosecutors, uh, you know, bringing the case against the defendant and the defendant's attorney defending the defendant and, uh, the jurors and the judge presiding, whatever the outcome of the trial is, as long as it's not a mistrial, as long as the trial unfolds according to the procedural rules of holding a trial, whatever that outcome is, is procedurally just. People might not be happy about the decision of the jury or the punishment, uh, the, the, the severity of the punishment established by the judge or whatever, or voted on by the jury but it's procedurally just. The stoic concept of justice is not understood in that limited legal sense. It's not a juridical concept. It has to do with the virtue of being just, a person being just. So there, there, there is a concept of a just institution, but in the ancient world, of course, we had slavery. There was slavery, right? And so, the, from our perspective as moderns, that's problematic because slavery is deeply unjust as an institution. We would agree, or most of us, virtually all of us would agree, right? But back then, it was seen as kind of uh, part of the furniture of the natural world. Of course, there are going to be people who lose battles, who lose wars. They're going to be taken as prisoners and made into slaves, but they can earn their freedom and they could be manumitted, that is, sent set free. Um, so uh, the ancients had a different sort of understanding. And of course, the Stoics, some Stoics did recognize that the notion of slavery was problematic. Seneca recognizes that, and yet he himself owned slaves. So it's not as if he set all of his slaves free as soon as they came into his possession. So they, they have a different notion of justice in that respect. So justice can be instantiated in a legal setting for the ancient Stoics, but it's a concept that I'm tempted to say transcends legalism. So if I could synopsize that, Stoic justice is rather refers to the way in which we interact with others who are not ourselves. Yes. Very good. So if we want to have a just character, for example, that doesn't mean we're someone who follows the letter of any specific law or the, a whole book of laws. It's that we know in any individual given situation, whether it's something that has to do with a criminal and a police officer, or if it's something that has to do with a mother and a son or two friends, we know the appropriate way to manage that interaction. That is what justice is in the Stoic world. Yes, very good. Right. So, so justice is what people deserve. Giving to it, the, the classic ancient definition was giving to each what they are owed. So, exactly. So, this, this, this guides all of our interpersonal interactions. So, all of our relationships, right? You're not going to take most of the time, you're not going to take your parents or your siblings to court just to figure out how to treat them. You're going to know what how to deal with them fairly as you as you described quite quite accurately right so this is this is justice right how, how do you treat other people what do you owe them right what be what belongs to them and the stoics were you know the early contributors to this notion of natural justice natural law i should say natural law right so human laws ought to derive from the laws of nature and this is part of the Stoic advance in this theorizing, right? 
I would imagine that anybody listening is going to be interested in developing a just character. So we're having a discussion about oikiosis. Now we're talking about justice. Obviously, oikiosis enables us to consider these. I don't think we've really mentioned the circles of concern yet, but uh, we probably should at this point. Circles of concern, Heracles, not Hercules. <laughs> Heracles. Heracles, yes. Heracles. <laughs> <laughs> I say I say Heracles. Now I'm the one who's wrong. Dang it. Uh, it's a set of concentric circles with the self at the center, and then I think it's family, and then it's uh, friends, and then it's community, and then it's other humans, and then it's non-human animals, and then it's nature. I combine those last two into biosphere. Uh, how do the circles of concern and the whole idea of oikiosis in general, how do they enable us to understand how to be just in the way that you've just explained it? Yeah, so so your listeners need to know that your innovation, Tanner, is very, very welcome, is very insightful, is to take these two-dimensional concentric circles described by Hierocles uh, millennia ago, right, and stretch them up and make them into a three-dimensional pyramid, right, which draws out the concept that you have to have a strong base and work your way up. So there's motion both from the base up to the tip of the pyramid, which is the self, and also in thinking about the relationships, you start at the tip of the pyramid at the peak and work your way down to the biosphere and all of nature at the base. So this three-dimensional uh, aspect or three-dimensional perspective is a very useful one conceptually, innovated by our host, Tanner Campbell. Thank you for that, Tanner. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Excellent. How dare you make yeah. this interview so, about me? <laughs> well, that's why you're the perfect person to conduct the interview. So the developmental movement is, you know, again, from the child, recognizes that it's not alone in the universe. There are things outside of it that are appropriate to it, others that are alien alien from it, right? So things that are going to harm its body, it wants to stay away from, right? So this is this is shaping its its very basic, most primal desires and aversions. It's averse to cold. It's averse to physical pain. It's averse to gravel, right? This is a soft, squishy little baby. It wants warmth, protection, food, right? Mother's milk, this sort of thing, right? And love, physical touch and love and affection from, from the parents, from the mother, right? But as it matures, it recognizes that, hey, you know, mom's pretty cool too. She belongs to me. I have parents. I have a mommy. I have a daddy, right? I have maybe sisters and brothers, right? And there are, there are companion animals in some of these households, right? There are dogs and cats and ferrets and birds and weasels and whatever else. Pot-bellied pigs some people keep, right? Rabbits, whatever sometimes even lizards and snakes. Please, please keep going. I want to see how many animals you can name. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Not too many people have giraffes in the household, let's hope, since they're wild animals. But anyway, if they're domesticated uh, companion animals in the household, then the child recognizes that they're part of the family too. And then their aunts and their uncles and their nieces and nephews and cousins. And so as, as the child grows up, it recognizes that there's an extended family. And then they're the next door neighbors. And then, it, you know, it, it gets playmates when it's in kindergarten and preschool and in the schoolyard, right? It's learning who its playmates are. And so then it acquires friends and the Stoics distinguish between, you know, natural and acquired relationships and, and, and well, parents are natural relations, right? You're born into your role as a child of parents and and having siblings but you also have acquired relationships and friends are one of the most important acquired relationships that a human being gets uh chooses over time and so we have this expanding circle of concern right these are my parents my neighbors my playmates my friends my cousins right my brothers and sisters and so forth and then you meet strangers and you recognize other kids in your classroom. You haven't met them yet, but they're strangers that could become friends and they're at least associates, they're fellow classmates. So you're always broadening these circles of concern to all members of the community, both other kids and adults and seniors <laughs> just wanted to throw yourself in there to make sure we didn't yeah forget. yeah you got to include the old people <laughs> got to include the old people too the grand the, the grandparents and whatnot. Oh, okay, so 
So we understand the circles of concern. Thank you for mentioning my pyramid of concern. I appreciate that. That was very kind of you. But how how does oikiosis and the circles of concern help us figure out when we're having those interactions with, let's say, family or friends, or we feel a responsibility to the community? How are we sussing out what is appropriate, what is a just interaction with, say, our mother, say, our local municipality because there's a something up for a vote and they want to build a swimming pool downtown or something and you feel a certain way about that. Does does oikiosis just help us to understand that this is a thing we must be concerned with or it is appropriate to be concerned with or does it extend beyond simply that and help us to navigate the figuring out of what appropriate looks like in this specific situation? Good question. Tough question. So, so the Stoics have this this conception of roles, right? Each of us have these roles, as I was mentioning, right? So when you're trying to figure out how to interact with your siblings, say, Epictetus suggests that it's really not hard to figure out how you should behave as a brother if to another brother, or if you're a brother relating to your sister or a sister to another sister. You ask yourself, what would a good sister do? What is it to be a good sibling? It's to treat your fellow sibling with respect and care and concern. It involves sharing. It involves compromise. It involves recognizing that you're members of the same family. So mutual respect, maybe even mutual admiration, right? And natural affection, right? Epictetus and the other Stoics emphasize that you have a natural affection most of the time, right? For your fellow siblings. And then, of course, for your parents. So what is it to be a good son? What is it to be a good daughter? Well, to recognize that your parents have been around longer than you have. They have more life experience than you do. So they could very well have more wisdom than you do. This sounds like a philosophy made by adults. And no kids listening appreciate this at all. (laughs) Only grown-ups. It is a philosophy for adults. (laughs) It is a philosophy for adults, right? Right? Kids, Kids, you know, think that you know, young kids often think they rebel against their parents. Why do we have these roles? Why aren't you letting me have fun? This sort of thing. And they don't stop to think that their parents were kids once too. People forget that all the time. They go, oh, my parents are a drag. They're old. They don't know what's going on. They're dinosaurs. No, they were, they were kids too. They've learned a thing or two, right? So older people are often a repository of wisdom that younger people don't appreciate. And I know this is going to sound a drag, sound like a drag (laughs) to young people, right? Because old people, they don't understand what's going on. And then it's true that that they're growing up in a different world in many respects than their parents grew up in. Let me point something out, though. I love that you just said that because no doubt, I think a significant number of quote unquote young people, which I'll just take to mean younger than the two of us. And I think that it's worth noting that one of the most striking things about any philosophy, you and I both are within the sphere of stoicism, so I'm going to use that as an example. And it's very, I mean, I'm always smacked in the face with it, which is these problems that we're discussing in contemporary times, when we go back and we look at Stoic writers, we're like, oh my God, they're trying to solve the same problems. So no matter what the the flavor of the day is, you know, whether it's Discord or Rob Blocks or Nintendo or Sega, I don't think Sega exists anymore. I'm dating myself right now. But no matter what <laughs> the thing is that's popular and what the old people don't get, at the core, we're still trying to figure out the same things. And we can see that as evidence is bet- between generations, it's less obvious, like your generation to my generation to whoever was next. You and I might even be part of the same generation. I'm not sure about that. Let's not discuss it publicly. We'll figure that out in private. Uh, so I think it's worth noting that if you're a young person listening to what William was just saying and you're rolling your eyes and be like, oh, he doesn't understand AI or Nintendos or whatever. That doesn't really matter because when you hit 25, 30, 35, the things that William wrangled with in his 30s at a fundamental level and that what I wrangled with in my 30s, they're going to be the same things that you wrangle with in your 30s. Yeah. Yeah, The human predicament doesn't change, right? You got to figure out how to make a living, how to relate to other people, right? You know, how how am I going to, you know, how am I going to provide for my family? Where am I going to live? How I'm going to make ends meet economically, all of this stuff. How am I going to save for my retirement? People need to think about that. Thank goodness we've got the social security system for that. If Congress keeps funding for, it, that would for be For now. <laughs> so for now, yeah, for the moment, right. 
So, so you were asking, so how do you use, so how does oikiotic thinking or how does oikiosis help us adjudicate these different roles? This is, this is a good question. And, and, and the thing that the Stoics suggest is that, you know, we do have to figure out how to cooperate. We are not alone in the universe. <laughs> we're not alone as individuals. And this is a big problem these days, right? I mean, post COVID, there are huge problems with people being lonely and isolated. This is a huge mental health problem in the world today. And so reaching out and connecting to other people is vital for human health, well being, and flourishing. The Stoics recognize that. So growing these this network the social network if we can call it that right building these ties with a, with each other feeling like a connected part of a greater whole this is what oikiosis is all about right we belong to the community we are not alone and isolated no person is an island right we're all connected with each other and oikiosis helps us understand that so when it comes to prioritizing our roles, as you were asking about, like, should the community build a, you know, a swimming pool or whatever, it, it requires us to get out of ourselves, right? And the Stoics have this other therapy, right? Take the view from above, look down on your community as if you were in a plane a thousand feet above the ground and see that from that perspective, human beings are very small and there are lots of them driving their cars around walking around taking commuter trains whatever it is right that it's about society as a whole right we are bees in a hive you've got to think of the good of the hive if you're one of the bees this is why bees do very well at cooperating they recognize that their very life depends on working with the fellow drones that without the queen bee, you're not going to have a new generation of baby bees, right? And so everybody has their job. Everyone needs to contribute to the good of the whole commonwealth. And, and it wasn't just the Stoics, but all of the ancients recognized and actually admired the degree of cooperation and, if you will, selflessness of individual bees. They're always acting to promote the common good of the hive because they recognize that without the hive, individual bees will die. Why can't human beings recognize that? We have to work together for our own good. We have to recognize that our own personal good is impossible to achieve without other people helping us. We depend on them as they depend on us. Our good is not separate cannot be separated from the good of society as a whole, of which we are a tiny, tiny part, an important part, but a tiny part nonetheless. So it's this holistic thinking that we are parts of the whole. Marcus Aurelius emphasizes this all the time. He is a very myriological thinker. Myriology is the branch of metaphysics that studies the relationship of part to whole. And oikiosis brings a richness to this kind of cooperative thinking, holistic thinking. Okay, but listen, William, you're just some hippie from, you know, where is Creighton University, North Dakota, Nebraska? It's in Nebraska. It's I'm Nebraska. from Indiana. You're, you're just, you no, you're some hippie from Indiana. You think stoicism is about cooperation. That's nonsense. I've seen stoic influencers online. It's all about going to the gym, getting ripped, and being a lone wolf. How am I wrong about that? Yikes. Yikes. <laughs> stoic bodybuilders. Good grief. I mean, they there could be stoic bodybuilders. I mean, sure. Right. So your your viewers may be interested in, I'm going to plug my own recent piece on actual stoicism, right? Is Santa a stoic? As you know, uh, we recently posted my little essay on, on Santa and stoicism. And one of the comments was that, you know, they the, the person said, Santa is a fat cookie munching elf. He's not what I think of when I think of a Stoic. And the, the commenter said, you know, Stoicism, you know, is, is exemplified by soldiers and warriors and, and strong people who work out and are self-sufficient, right? These sorts of 
you know, images come to mind, right? And 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 athletes, strong athletes doing their own thing, right? This sort of these sorts of examples. And and so my my response was, well, you know, that that's <laughs> That's a rather narrow conception. I didn't say this, but it's a rather narrow conception of stoicism. Stoicism is not for brawny 18-year-old males. Exclusively. Right, alone. Right, alone. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're an if you're an artist, if you like music and literature, this doesn't rule you out for being a stoic. It doesn't have to do with having big muscles. I think it's probably important here. Can, can we point out here that Marcus Aurelius was kind of a sickly, not a muscly dude? I mean, he was the emperor, but he wasn't exactly, he wasn't a brawny Olympian. But he did wrestle too. He did wrestle. He, well, he, he did have, yes, he, he did have health problems, but he wasn't, he wasn't scrawny either because he, he, in an early age, he was trained to, uh, he, you know, to wrestle. I've always kind of envisioned him as Wart from Sword in the Stone. That's how I imagined him as a kid. Do you not remember Wart? I mean, I know he was rich, but as I imagine him this kind of gangly thing that's sick a lot and is not really that well built. Well, we'd have to look. I, I don't know if there 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 are a few full body statues. I don't I don't I don't know how. Wouldn't Wouldn't that be insane if we find these long forgotten, lost to time? We find these statues, and he's got brawny shoulders, but he's like skipping leg day all the time. That's what he looks like. <laughs> It's very <laughs> top heavy. Yeah, maybe, maybe so. Maybe so. That would be <laughs> archaeologists would be thrilled. Well, they would be thrilled. <laughs> yes, they would. Yeah, they would. Really good new statues of Marcus Aurelius. Okay, well, th that got silly. Let's let's move on from the silly. So it's not about muscles. Yes, yeah, stoicism is not about muscles. It's not about being a loner, a lone wolf. No, 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 no. Wolves hunt in a pack. Wolves hunt in a pack. They cooperate, right? It, 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 we see this with animals all the time, right? And and human beings are like other non-human animals, gregarious. We hang out with others of our kind. This is why being a hermit is contrary to nature for Stoics, right? Going back to Aristotle, he, he says, you know, to to be an isolated individual, like like an isolated uh, piece uh, in checkers or chess, means you can't contribute. You can't work for your team. Right? We have teammates. Human beings are teammates. We're on the same human team. And and our team, for it to flourish, uh, and this might be leading to your next question about the environment, right? For us to flourish as a species, we can't think only in terms of what's going to promote our human good, but we depend on the ecosystems that we live in. And so if we collectively behave in ways that tear down the integrity and stability, as Aldo Leopold describes, a healthy, thriving ecosystem, it's integrated, it's stable, right? If, if our practices, if our economic habits tear down that stability, that integrity, if it fragments the ecosystem, if it accelerates ex uh, the extinction of other species, if it reduces biodiversity of species, then it's going to make it harder for us to feed ourselves. We're not going to have clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, healthy organic food, healthy food to eat. Uh, and we're going to have a much worse climate than we're we're bequeathing to our next generation of children now. There is so much I want to say about the last two minutes of you speaking. Um, but before I say anything about that, I think I need to... I'm, I look so upset right now. I'm so distraught. Uh, I, I think I need to mention that just so it's not... We're taking a lot of things for granted, I think, William, because of our backgrounds, especially... I mean, your background is far deeper than mine. But we know some things that maybe the general public don't know about Stoicism. Maybe somebody watching this knows absolutely nothing about Stoicism. It's the first time they're ever hearing anyone talk about Stoicism, let alone oikiosis. It is possible for the appropriate choice for you in a situation would be to be a lone wolf. That could be the appropriate thing to do. But you have, you'd have you have to work out logically that it was. And to give an opposite view of that, it might be the right thing to be a cookie mon a cookie munching, jolly fat man. Elf. Elf. Yeah. If if <laughs> your role in society is to be a jovial yes. gift giving yes. embodiment of yes. happiness and joy, right? Like that yes. is then then yes. it becomes appropriate. So we're not saying that if you're a bodybuilding lone wolf type, that you that that's not stoic. But it is important to say that that's not what stoicism must be 
lest you not be a stoic or lest something not be stoic yes largely i would i would push back just a little bit i mean hey bodybuilding is great i mean this is something i should do more of right as i age right studies suggest that to keep your bones strong you need to lift more as you age, you know, you need to lift some weights. I've never done this. I'm really bad at this. I'm a tennis player. I'm not a weightlifter. This is something I need to work on. So there's absolutely nothing wrong. And in fact, it's it's still part of voikiosis that you would take care of your body. It's only rational or prudent to do so. And so weightlifting and building up your body and be, being physically fit, this is appropriate. This is prudent. It's the lone wolf part. I mean, I suppose that if you're in the military and you have a particular mission that you're assigned, that you have to go in by yourself covertly in order to pull off some sort of mission. But in my understanding, th this doesn't happen in the military. They never send a, a soldier in by him or herself, even if you're on a SEAL team. You're on a team. You have a squad, right? So so human beings, you, you could be find yourself stranded. You could find yourself all by yourself behind enemy lines or on a, uh, you know, shipwrecked, right? On a desert island or something because your plane crashed, everyone else dies, and you survive in your Tom Hanks on this isolated island in the South Pacific. You could, it's possible logically to find yourself in that sort of situation, in which case, yeah, in order to survive, you, you better be self-sufficient you got to catch your own fish you got to figure out how to crack open your walnuts and and you know whatever food you can find on the island until you know you you hope to be rescued but in circumstances like that the stoics well i don't want to talk about suicide but there could be circumstances in which rather than starve slowly to death it would be appropriate to take your own life if, if you don't think that there's any chance that you could be saved as you're stranded in, in that situation but my point is just that the lone wolf scenario is extremely rare. 99.8% of the time, you got to figure out how to cooperate with other people and be a teammate, be a coworker, be a fellow citizen, fellow neighbor. And this requires working with other people, not in isolation from other people. Yeah, it's this little bit of a, I don't know how to, co it's a confusing, I can see why people think this. I can sympathize, or maybe the right word is empathize with, with people who view stoicism in this way, because being resilient, being firm in some ways, I suppose, taking care of one's body to a, an acceptable or appropriate degree. It does seem like these things, when chasing virtue, which we're not going to get into because this isn't actually a, this is supposed to be about archaeosis. We're not going to get, we're not going to talk about uh, virtue in stoicism, but it does seem that these things do tend to be side effects of someone who, like the sage is going to be, if you're, if you're a stoic sage, you're the perfect stoic, you're, you're trapped on an island, you're not bothered. Everything's fine because you're perfect. You're the perfect specimen of, of a stoic human being. I think what I'm trying to say is that the point of stoicism is to it's it's to be able to be that way that we're discussing. It's the ability to be a lone wolf. It's the ability it's the ability to if you're in that situation to be those things, but it's not the point is not to be those things. <laughs> Right. The Very good. Yes. Adaptation. Right. Stoics know how to adapt. They adapt and overcome. That's right. That's right. You you can adapt to whatever the circumstances are because you have the mental resources to do so. You have your faculty of reason and you can problem solve and you can recognize what you need to do to to not only survive but flourish and adapt to nature, right? You're given lemons, you make lemonade. It doesn't mean you go out looking for lemons to make lemonade, right? It just means that you can were life to give you lemons. Right, exactly. Okay. Yeah. They have to be seasonal. Yes, that's right. Lemons are seasonal, I think. Unless you're tropical, then maybe they're there all the time. Who knows? We're neither one of us own farms or plantations. No. Do you grow lemons on a plantation? Uh, an orchard, something like that? A vineyard? I don't know. Orchard, I think. Let's get let's get let's get on from lemons and, and let me wrap this episode up by saying we're almost to the top of the hour which means we're going to leave you. But before that, because I do want to talk about environment, but I feel like we had to lay <laughs> lay a lot of track to get here. So so we know that oikios is about, is about seeing and understanding and coming to grips with what things are appropriately ours to be concerned with. That is our family, our friends, our community. And this is visualized through the Stoic Circles of Concern by Hierocles and my own conical 
pyramid. Or, or conal pyramid of concern. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. Which you can learn more about, by the way, because I felt it necessary to do this by going to pyramidofconcern.com. Yes, I really did that. I just wanted to make sure that <laughs> nobody took it from me. Um, whether it, that, That's a great way to visualize those things. But if we're doing that, we get to a point where we actually have to practically act on this stuff, right? So we come to global warming. You can I don't think anybody at this point disagrees that global warming is happening. I think that mostly what people tend to disagree with nowadays is whether it's mostly a human caused thing or mostly a thing that would happen anyway. I think that's where most people are on it. Um, but I think a lot of people are in the camp of human beings definitely have something to do with it and we should make some changes. So let's assume that the people listening are in that camp. And if you're not in that camp, you can stop listening to this last, the last five minutes of this podcast episode and and take from it what, you, what you've already taken and uh, be well, I hope. How does... How how do we, as anybody who wants to be someone who feels that they intimately understand what is appropriate for them to be concerned with, we've identified that the biosphere and nature is appropriate for us to be concerned with. Gosh, that seems like a really big job, William. It seems like there's a hundred things I could be doing every moment of every day. I could go start a recycling thing. I could make sure that I'm recycling properly. I could wash out all my Coke cans and all my food bottles, and I could make my life do nothing but concern itself with doing things that were good for the biosphere. And it would seem like I would let other things go by being completely consumed by this one aim. So there must be a balance. And how does an individual find a balance with being concerned with those other circles that we mentioned, but not completely ignoring non-human animals in the biosphere and the environment? How, how does somebody listening do that? Great question. Great question. So so as you were suggesting before, Tanner, what's key is, one, one key is to recognize your own talents and your own passions. The other thing is to remember that everyone has multiple roles at the same time. All of us have many different roles, right? We're children of parents. We might be grandparents of children. We might have children or be children of parents. We might have siblings. We're certainly going to have friends. We're going to have co-workers. We're going to have other relatives, aunts, uncles, nephews, nieces. We're fellow travelers, right? Whenever you travel a short distance or a long distance, there are others traveling with you unless you're on your private jet. But even then, you've got your pilot, right? You're not flying your own plane, right? So they're fellow commuters on the train. They're fellow commuters on the bus. You know, they're fellow motorists that you're sharing the highway with, right? You're also a taxpayer and a citizen, and there are people in your community that, that you see in your organizations, right? So we have, and if you're a professional, you have a fiduciary responsibility. Either you're a doctor or you're a patient. Sometimes you're a patient, even if you're never a doctor, right? Sometimes you're a teacher, sometimes you're a student. There are just so many different roles. We're mentors and we're mentees, right? So we, we inhabit all of these different roles and some of them we engage with for a few moments or a few days and then not again for weeks. How do we sort all this out? We use our reason. Some roles become more urgent at one time and become less important at others. And so it's a dynamic situation. So how do we decide how we're going to help and promote to the common good and, and do our part to work against global climate change, what, what improvements, what policies can we advocate for as citizens, right? Maybe even as protesters, right? And the answer is it's going to depend. If we're articulate, if we're comfortable talking in front of other people, then we can be an advocate. It's natural to be able to do that. However, that's not for everybody, naturally. Some people are going to be more soft-spoken. Some people are not going to be as articulate. But they can still volunteer in ways that are going to be fulfilling to them behind the scenes, right? Stuffing envelopes, right? Sending out emails, whatever it is, right? Collecting signatures on a petition. Different people are good at different things. And so recognizing your own talents, your own strengths, and following your own passions is going to help guide you in deciding how to volunteer, how to give back, how to contribute to your community, both locally and globally. If you've got the impulse and the skills and you're good at raising money, run for office. Get political, right? Put together a campaign and become an elected official, right? 
If you prefer to work as a private citizen, you can join other private citizens who are like-minded working for good ends. And all of us are consumers. And so how we spend our money and what we buy. I've argued in a couple different pieces that it's significant that most of the ancient Stoics were vegetarians. Most of the ancient Stoics thought that because of moderation and self-control, it isn't really very virtuous to go out of your way to spend a lot of money and time and effort getting meat and eating a lot of meat in your diet. So most of the ancient Stoics are vegetarians and they tied it to virtue. I know we weren't supposed to talk about virtue in this episode, but today there's even more reason for us to eat low on the food pyramid, right? Eat food that doesn't require a lot of resources, isn't intensively raised using a lot of gasoline, a lot of water just to produce the food, right? So our diet is can be and ought to be informed by our environmental vision of what counts as treading lightly on the planet. I want to make sure that I step in here and say that some people who are listening, if they've stuck through, might be irritated at this because it feels like this discussion is always couched in like a political us versus them, right? Whichever side you are on eating meat specifically is what I mean. I want to make sure that anyone who's hanging out and feeling a little frictiony, feeling a little irritated, this is a conversation ultimately about character. And so what William had said earlier, what would a good sister do? What would a good sibling do? What you're going to be encouraged to ask yourself a lot is going to be, what would a good citizen of Earth do about X? And is that how you are behaving? That is what this conversation is really about. When William says uh, you should eat lower on the food pyramid, he's not meaning to, I don't, and correct me if I'm wrong, William, you're not trying to make a political statement. You are trying to make a ethical statement that relates to a person's virtue, be, uh, sorry, uh, to a person's character and to a person's virtue, I suppose, in that how you eat, the choices you make about what you eat is a direct reflection of the kind of concerns that you have and the way that you're approaching trying to have just relationships with those various circles, which we talked about earlier. So this is not a political commentary. This is a, look, I eat meat. I think I should have led with that. I eat meat. Um, but what I have done to try to reduce that is I'll only eat, um, for, for example, halal meat because it's, especially now because my, my wife is huge on this, uh, I will only eat halal meat because of the way that the animal was killed was more humane, right? That's, that's the basis of it anyway. And we kind of only use the meat to flavor dishes rather than making them the main star of the dish. Now, that doesn't mean that I didn't just make a steak and mashed potatoes for New Year's Eve dinner last night. I did. I did do that. So it's, a not, it's not about being all or nothing or perfect. It's about working through any situation like what we were talking about before and determining what is appropriate in those given conditions. So William, you're, you're not a vegan, are you? No, no. Oh, oh see, no, but the way you but, said but that, I you were respect- like, God, no. <laughs> But some people are, and you respect it, right? Right. And, and so, so as you were saying, you know, it, it, it's a matter of being mindful in your dietary choices. And of course, people have different dietary needs, right? Some people need to eat more meat than others because this is how they get their iron, right? If they run the risk of being anemic and and, uh, and people have various food allergies. And so there, there are various challenges that people face, but they are tied to character. So, so I agree that, that you know this is not overtly political at all. It, it, it is tied to what, what works for you and what's going to promote your mental health, physical health, and help you advance, help you progress uh, toward the ethical ideals that you espouse. It's not, a, of course, it's not about perfection. There's no such thing as a perfect diet, right? People, people need to eat healthy for them, right? And so, yeah, it's not about it's not about all or nothing. I mean, it's never gonna, it, it's not gonna be the case that you know everyone's gonna become a vegan overnight. But some people do aspire to eating less meat less often, or as you were saying, you know, they're mindful that the the, the the meat that they're eating is from an animal that was killed humanely, right? And certain kinds of meat are going to be more intensively raised. The animals that, that provide the meat are going to be more intensive than others. So depending on, I mean, some people eat, eat goat meat. And these days, people are developing, you know, grasshoppers and other insects to eat for their protein. 
and and it's very much a matter of habit so it's a complex issue it's a complex issue but it, it is tied to character and learning more about how the food that you eat impacts the pe- planet and how it's produced because listen we're gonna have some dystopian future if we don't get our shit together your big turkey dinner is imagine a big fat turkey but it's not a big fat turkey it's a big fat grasshopper and you're breaking off a grasshopper leg <laughs> and dumping it in grasshopper gravy you don't want to be doing that <laughs> Grasshopper gravy. You gotta balance out here. What would that even be? That's disgusting. Yeah. Grasshopper gravy. Okay. But it's worth learning. Pe- people people should inform themselves. It, it, it's good to knowledge is power. And to become empowered, uh, you, ne- you need to learn more about how food is produced. A lot of people don't know much at all about how the food that they eat every day without thinking about it is produced. And so learning more about the amount of water, the amount of gasoline, the amount of CO2 emissions that are produced by producing a particular kind of food, these things must inform, ought to, and, and really have to inform our decisions about what we buy and what we consume, not just what we put in our mouth, but but our clothing and whatever other products that we purchase and have delivered by Amazon to our door. And if your response is, I don't have time to think about any of that stuff, then that's fine. Just keep in mind that that position, I don't have time to think about that stuff, is a reflection of your character. You get to determine for yourself what a good character is. We're just going to try to help you along the way, or I'm going to try to help you. William, thank you for being here. I appreciate you taking the time. A solid hour, baby. I appreciate that. Thank you, Tanner. Enjoyed it. Take care. Be well. Happy New Year, my friend. 